All right. Well, hey, kids, welcome back to the Paranormal Peeps podcast. Congratulations. You made it back. You didn't get lost. Good job. Yay. Okay. So, so go ahead, Josh. <laughs> Thank you for not leaving us. Yeah. Not a lot, not abandoning us like a child at a gas station in the middle of nowhere. So, anyway, um, just want to give a, a quick uh, reference to uh, our, our dearly lost um, Alisa. She's not with us tonight. She had some family come into town and uh, she's hosting, so she couldn't we'll be with us. We will miss her. We will miss her. But here we do have Josh. Josh. Jamie. Terry. And I am Lord Mikey. You don't have to call me your lordship, but you can if you want to. <laughs> he prefers it. I think it's cool. It's yes, fun. your lordship. It's fun. I created a monster. Um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we did have a, a paranormal investigation last weekend, and we were we were so kindly invited by our good friend Tim Behunen from the EVP podcast. He uh, invited us to come out to the Benson Grist Mill and... Just wanted to say publicly, thanks, Tim. Oh, that was, was so awesome. much thanks, fun. Tim. Him and it the Buko boys, good guys there. He, he does he does a great uh, potluck, and so we all had lots of tasty food to, to munch on and going around and uh, investigating, talking to the ghosts. It was, it was so it fun. Was, there was, was fun. people there that we haven't seen in so oh, long. Yeah. It was yeah. so nice to see everybody. And none again. of the food was awful. No. It was all very good. It was all so good. I didn't eat all of it, so I couldn't tell you, but some of the stuff I had was freaking amazing. Yeah. The best. What? The best. Hand, hands down the best was uh shane from bear river paranormal his uh um fruity pebbles rice crispy treats with with extra with double marshmallow <laughs> <laughs> it was delightful it has to be the double marshmallow i had right? so much and the fruity pebbles next was... time i think i i told i need to bring hot dogs next time though oh my gosh anyway <laughs> But we had some great stuff. We did get some awesome evidence. We got some great EVPs. Uh, we'll talk about those on another podcast. I don't want to blow the wad all right now. Definitely not. But uh, anyway, we just wanted to let you know. We do still actually investigate, you know, and it was a lot of fun. We just want to say thanks to Tim and, and all the all the folks out there that were there. It was pretty cool. Thank you. So, Absolutely. So uh, tonight we've got a great podcast for you. Now, I got to be honest. So doing the research on this, there was so much I didn't know. And doing the research several times kind of just made my draw, my jaw drop and my stomach turn. Yeah, I have to agree. I think this is probably the most disturbing uh, in, uh, research research <laughs> I've ever had to do. It, like it was it's rough and raw and it's. It, it is. It's hard to believe that actually an individual what is actually capable of doing these things. So that being said, I do want to put the, the disclaimer out there that this episode may not be for little children. <laughs> Don't listen to it in the car with your five-year-old. Um, some of this may be disturbing to some people. But, uh, Terry, did you have something you want no, to say? No, I was going to say, I listened to and studied a lot of serial killers, but this was the most disturbing one I've ever ever dived into you know i thought doing ed gein when i was back on the other show was pretty disturbing because you know he would actually like leatherface you know he would actually skin people and yeah yeah no i i think this just he ta- this one takes the cake i think it does it's, he's he's even worse than gacy he's he's worse see, yeah, than Dahmer, gacy, which is hard to believe and and the part of this is because the the, fa- the fact that there was really no mo there was no I don't know. There was just so unpredictable and just uh, everywhere you turn, it's like, oh, here's something else. And it's different and it's it was, gruesome and just sick. Yeah. Anyone and everyone could have been a victim. So if you haven't figured it out, just by us talking about how gross it was, we're going to talk about uh, Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker. Sounds like radio, right? <laughs> you are listening to 97.9 with the Night Stalker. um so i do want to give just a little bit of credit so some of the stuff that i have a lot of the the homework i do is or do have uh came from a a podcast called the hollywood crime scene podcast uh the ladies were great had a ton of info that i couldn't find anywhere else um and a lot of their stuff came from a book called the life and crimes of richard ramirez the night stalker by philip caro so that book has a ton of detail that's because uh, he actually sat down with Ramirez in San Quentin and interviewed him. Yep. 
So I can't even imagine what that type of conversation would be like. Well, I think most of the, just even all the stories we have and a lot of the information we have on the murders about the things that he did have to have come from him because if the people were killed, you know, I mean, they can figure out so much by forensic evidence, you know, like, oh yeah, he sat down and ate a sandwich after he was done. You know, I mean, they can tell that kind of stuff, but as far, a lot of the timelines and stuff, I think he had to have filled a lot of these things in. Oh yeah. And so. He was, he was very happy. Happy to talk about it. Yeah. Happy about the things that he did. He's proud of it. He, yeah, he was very proud of it. And he, he claims that he's killed more people than he's been given credit for. I don't doubt that, honestly. Yeah, in fact, he wanted to be pen pals with... Uh... Oh, I can't remember. Charles Manson? No. Sorry. Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy. Ooh. Yeah, he wanted to be pen pals with Ted Bundy. I feel like Ted Bundy's like classier. He is. I mean, still sadistic and everything, yes. He's but, my favorite. But, you know. Good old Utah boy. He looks like Zac Efron. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> He's a handsome man. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you couldn't get Zac Efron to play Richard Ramirez, could you? No. No, Who but do you get? Lou Diamond Phillips. Wilbur Valderrama? No. <laughs> Lou Diamond Phillips would be Lou a good Diamond one. Phillips might be able to do it. He Justin. might be yeah. the best especially, one. especially like 80s Lou Diamond Phillips, like early like late 80s early 90s. But you have, perfect. You do have to wonder. I have I don't know if anybody has interviewed uh uh Ross Lynch who did Jeffrey Dahmer or um Zach Efron about it, but how it, it changed them. You know, they talk about how uh these two innocent Disney childhood stars right. <laughs> portraying yeah. well, it's just like serial people that murders. portray the Joker, you know, like Jack Nicholson told Heath Ledger, don't take the role because it'll muss you up being the Joker. And it did. I'm he not was, sure that's all of it. I mean he, he was, was amazing. The best Joker that oh, he was, yeah, he was hands down amazing. And then this Jared Leto guy comes on, and you're just like, who the heck is this Joker? <laughs> <laughs> Weak. Heath forever. Go Heath. But anyway, I have to wonder if playing these, uh, you know, characters wears on you. Has to. I mean, even the yeah. old Mark Harmon, uh, the perfect was a perfect stranger. I think with Mark Harmon, that was the Ted Bundy one. That's the one I grew up with. No. I don't then know. I'd watch stuff like Summer I School. Know, I'm like, it's Ted Bundy. <laughs> Don't trust him. He's not a teacher. He's, he's right. Anyway, so let's get into uh, Richard Ramirez's life. Let's get into life before Richard Ramirez. We'll go back before. a little bit. We're going we're gonna to go back a little bit before. You before get, he was born. You got to get the whole story. So the family uh, lived in uh, Juarez, Mexico, but they moved to El Paso. And uh, the cities, uh, these cities had dealt with the fallout of the nuclear testing of Los Alamos, New Mexico. And so it was stuff where there was stuff, you know, suspected to have poisoned the land and the water, which would lead to a lot of medical issues for the people there and also for the first two sons of uh, Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. Those are his uh, parents. Some speculate that it would contribute to the behavioral issues that all of the Ramirez children would have. Uh, the oldest son, Ruben, was born very sick. He had a golf ball sized lumps all over his head when he was born. But he eventually got better. Uh, The second son, Joseph, seemed to fine initially, but then began nonstop crying. You know, the kind of crying that was like he was in great pain, uh, not just that whiny feed me. He was he was in pain. And it turned out that he had a painful bone disease. Um, The third son, uh, Robert, is born. And uh, at this time, uh, his father, Julian, or who I keep going to say Julian a lot, but it's Julian. Uh, was a Mexican national and a former Sidiuad. I can't do Spanish. Sidiuad Juarez <laughs> policeman. I don't think so, any here, anybody C- here can do Spanish. Ciudad? Cuidad? I don't know. The city of Juarez, okay? Yep, that works. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just Americanize it. He was a former policeman. He later became a laborer in Texas work construction and then ended up on the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railways. Um, as a uh, laborer, he was prone to fits of anger that often resulted in physical abuse. Uh, this time, Mercedes got a job in a Tony Lama boot factory. And she's basically working in sweatshop conditions. Uh, there's no ventilation. And uh, she's working with chemicals where she makes um, and uses the dyes that uh, color the leather for these boots. That was her job, was dealing with these chemicals and these dyes. Um, it was funny. The ladies on that other podcast, they had never heard of Tony Lama. Like, What's Tony Lama? I'm like, are you serious? 
It's like a high end boot. It's like it's like not knowing what Nike. It's is. like the number one right? boot maker, <laughs> Tony Lama or Roper, are like the top two. I mean, I could name like ten others. But anyway, but I thought is, that was funny. It is Texas, and I think these ladies were from California, so they ah, might probably, not know Tony. Probably, Lama. anyways. But yeah, so her, her mom's already his mom's already working with chemicals and stuff. Um, she becomes pregnant with Ruth, their only daughter, during this period. And then uh, by the time she's pregnant with her fifth child, uh, Ricardo Richard Ramirez, the uh, chemicals that she works with are beginning to actually affect, make an af- take effect on her body and make her body reject her fetus. Uh, she, must, she has to get multiple shots and treatments to keep her body from having contractions and going into early labor. By the time she's five months along, she's told by all the doctors to stop working in the factory or that she's going to lose the baby. It was cer- she was certain that it was a boy because he was always pounding and kicking inside her. He was like a little nightmare in there. Just He was a constant mover. He was. Um, <laughs> he was a monster then. Um, so uh, baby's born on February 29th, 1960, and named Ricardo. Uh, the family calls him Richie. Uh, Father Julian is struggling with the pressure of five kids and working all the time, and he's He's prone to those fits of anger, and they, like I said, they do often uh, result in physical abuse of Mercedes and the kids. Uh, Mercedes would go on to say that all of her children had explosive anger problems, even Ruth, um, which apparently that's surprising that the girls get angry. It's like, I'm married. I know women get angry. (laughs) Both of the women in the room just rolled their eyes. (laughs) And we stay completely silent. <laughs> and, and I just snicker and I stay completely silent. I cannot deny this. Yes. <laughs> I will not confirm nor deny. Uh... So, the more uh, behavior issues are popping up with the older children, the more violent uh, Julian gets. His anger is mostly centered on Ruben, the oldest. He finds him disobedient and is upset that he's really not trying hard in school. Uh, at the age of two, uh, Richard has his first head injury. Uh, he has a babysitter there, a babysitter there that's really not paying attention. And Richard climbs up a dresser, kind of pulls the drawers out, climbs up the dresser. And uh, as you can imagine, the big heavy dresser falls over on top of him. Uh, Terry had it in her, in her research. She'd found that. Uh, well, the babysitter was watching TV and uh, he wanted the radio turned on so he could listen to the radio. And she was too busy watching TV, told him no. And him just being the. You know, the power headed. He's kind. only three years old at this point. He's I only mean, three. On. But he was bound and determined to get that radio turned on because it's what he wanted and he wanted it then and he wanted it now. So he. Sounds like Veruca Salt. Yeah. I want the radio. <laughs> so he. I want the old radio. He found a way to try to turn the radio on and ended up getting a big gash <laughs> and 30 stitches on his forehead. I wonder if he actually got the radio on before it fell over, though. I don't know. He was. He actually was unresponsive for 15 minutes after it happened. But yeah, 30, uh, so 30 stitches to close the laceration. It, it's amazing that he didn't actually die from it. In right. Because oh, yeah. like, there's warnings on all of like, if you get like these chest of drawers or these dressers and stuff, they're like, warning, you know, can we fall, you know, can fall over on your kid. Yeah. Well, and he, you know, he had to have had a concussion. He probably had a hairline fracture in his skull. Probably no. Because my, my brother had one of those when he was little from falling and hitting a tile floor. He had a hairline fracture in his skull. So there's probably more damage done. That explains done. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there was probably more damage done that they don't realize, you know, because back what was that in the sixties? Yeah, I don't know, you know, what extensive medical care they would have done on something like that. Well, and could they have even afforded it? Like, it True. doesn't sound like they were really well off. And <laughs> True, <laughs> not and, even close. Yeah, <laughs> so and, they might have not have even never done an X-ray to even see. Yeah, and then and that doesn't even show how much blame, blame, jeez, brain bleeding. He would have had yep. on top of that. Cause on top of that. Because 30, you know, you think a big gash on your forehead for 30 stitches, there's got to be more damage done there. Oh, yeah. That's like a cross your, for a little kid. That's probably from like eye yeah. to eye. Uh-huh. Because yeah. he's three. How big is a little three-year-old's head, you know? Not very big. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's say I had to do different layers of stitches. I don't know. I don't know. I've Ooh. seen that before. Do you have another skull? It's true. It's fairly are... thin. Yeah. Really thin skin, so. Um, yeah, subsequently, the, the uh, Julian was pretty upset and the babysitter was fired. Uh, it was the go, babysitter's fault. Go figure on that one. <laughs> well, yeah, honestly, it, was, it kind of it was her fault. It was fault. her fault. She wasn't paying attention. I babysat kids and I'm in charge. Yeah, she wasn't taking care of them and she was too busy watching TV. So uh, Richie does go on to uh, do all that he can to escape his violent home life. Um, this would lead him 
this is as, as a little kid, he would often go hang out and then go sleep in cemeteries to just to get away from his father. At what age did he start doing this? That wasn't until his teens. Was it? Okay. Yeah. So Reuben, oldest brother, starts committing petty crimes and sniffing glue. Uh, Julian is mortified when Reuben gets arrested and he beats the crap out of him right there in front of the whole family as they all watched in terror. So um, imagine being a little kid and seeing your older brother just getting clobbered by your dad. Yeah, in fact, in that fight, the mom had to jump in the middle to stop it. Because she stood back for a while, but it got so severe that she was getting worried for her son's life that she jumped in to pull the dad off of their son because it got so bad. See, so don't piss your dad off. I'm just telling you. Annika, I hope you're listening. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not violent. Uh, so Reuben, Robert, and then Joseph all begin sniffing glue at some point, and Mercedes decides that if she prays, it will make it better. And it did not. Um, Julian also takes his rage out on himself. One time when he was unable to fix a sink, uh, he ends up uh, upset. He bangs himself in the head with a hammer multiple times with blood running down his face as his children watched in stunned silence. Uh, another time he couldn't fix a car, and I think it was an oil filter, if I remember right. Yeah, it was a fuel and, filter on and his And he truck. hit himself in the head or banged his head on a wall until he bled. You know, all this in front of his kids. And the kids say they could never get the image of him with the hammer banging himself in the head with a hammer out of their heads. Yeah, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine seeing that for one. Mm-hmm. But you got to I mean, the first thought is like, well, why didn't anybody stop him? But I'm sure there was tons of fear because they're like, if I say anything to dad, he's just going to turn that hammer on me. And then well, and they're just kids. I mean, you're just kind of sitting there stunned going, what the heck? Yeah. I mean, I think most adults do that. I mean, only the smart and quick ones get their cell phones out to start filming before, you know. (laughs) Nowadays. Most of the rest of us were like, dang, why didn't I record that? It's like, because I was too stunned. (laughs) Do we have, do we know how old, like, uh, Ramirez was when this was going on? Young. Um, Just young. We haven't even hit him. He's not even five yet at this point. Yeah. So this is all between two and five or three and five. Yeah. Could be even six. The thing is, is he was he was born so much later than all of his other siblings um, that he spent a lot of time home alone. And that's why he had all the babysitters because his parents were working. Then he had the babysitters. So all of his older siblings were in school while he was home. Well, so all this happened sniffing glue. Yeah. So he was m- so much younger than all the other ones. That was why he had a hard time. Um Making friends and <laughs> sorry, just don't give Mike glue. No, <laughs> that's why he had such a hard time making friends and just the social aspect of his life because you know he wasn't an only child but was kind of almost raised like an only child because he was so much younger than all of his other siblings. Yeah, and I've heard of that from other people who have been that off child. Uh huh. It's like, well, you know, I know I have older siblings, but really I was raised alone because they were off doing their own things <laughs> jamie's a robot <laughs> Sorry. so uh at this time richie's very close and when he gets to the age of five he's at a park and running toward ruth when a swing hits him in the head and knocks him out cold this is head injury number two yeah he was five it was in 1965 um because ruth was the next it was the one closest to him in age and so him and ruth became really close and ruth kind of became his protector but she hit him in the head with a swing. <laughs> Not her fault. So, well, he it, came running you know, toward her and smacked stuff him. Happens. We've all been there. I've fallen off the swings. I've been hit by kids on swings. And, mm-hmm. So yeah. that's head injury two. Stitches twice in the head. They, this I don't know how many stitches he got. Um, but then when they took him to the doctors. But it knocked him out cold. So it knocked him out cold. Hit. But they <laughs> gave him a total clear bell of health to start school. Well, let's face it. This is 65, right? Right. This like is, we were saying. Rub some dirt on it. Yeah, exactly. Rub yeah. some dirt on it. Walk it off. You got like it. we were saying with the it's, first head injury, you know, because obviously he probably had a second concussion there. And it's like, what, two years from the first one? So. It reminds me of the old. Uh, two, three, I depending say, on uh-huh. time frame. Yeah. I want to say it's like a Saturday evening post picture. I've seen it like there's a doctor examining a little kid like with the stethoscope and the doctor's got a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. It's like, what we know now. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Terry, tell us about uh, the seizures. Okay. So um, he started school. And in first grade, when he was taking a math test, he turned around. I don't know what he was turning around for. But then the teacher, you know, kind of snapped at him for breaking the rules. And all of a sudden, he fell 
um, to the floor in a state of shock and had his first epileptic seizure. Uh, the school nurse um, told his mother to take him to the doctor, but Richard, being bullheaded, refused to go and told his mom just to take him home. I mean, what kind of a six-year-old bosses his mom around and says, no, I'm not going to the doctor? <laughs> you know? I mean, I would be concerned. but So she took him home and let him play. But, however, the very next day he had another seizure, so she took him directly to the hospital, and he was diagnosed with epilepsy and grand mal seizures. Um, she was, his mom was told that he was going to eventually grow out of it, so they didn't get any medication for him. I don't even know if they could have afforded the medication that he would have needed. And so they just figured he'd grow out of it, and so they just figured it was nothing more than just an inconvenience for, you know, a couple years of his life. Um, however... Um, as he was getting older, his sister would notice that he would just stop what he was doing, just stop. And he would just randomly stare in random directions for like 15 minutes. And then he would continue, continue on doing what he was doing. Um, we actually ended up finding out that these were petty mall seizures that he was having. And when he was having these petty mall seizures, he would have like these horrific visions of monsters of all shapes and sizes that would just come crashing into his reality. And that's why he would just like stop. And just kind of stare. And then when he'd come out of it, he wouldn't even realize that he'd even stopped what he was doing because he just went from one reality to a different reality in his mind. Um, and he was having um, one to two dozens of these a month. Whoa. Um, let's see. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's basically one a day. Yeah. 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 And so when he would tell his family about these monsters that when he'd see, they just kind of wrote, wrote it off as just childhood imagination. Um. They really wouldn't believe him. But he always just kind of knew that these monsters were always just hiding and lurking, waiting for him. So he kind of ended up in a state of fear for a while when he was young. So then he ended up being diagnosed with a temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so you think, you know, with all of his head injuries, if this is what caused his epilepsy, who knows? Um, when he was 12 in 1972... He started to build a better relationship with his father. He was getting good grades in school. He ended up being the star quarterback of the middle school football team. So this desire of the relationship he wanted to have with his father was starting to build. But then in the middle of a football game, he has a seizure and falls to the ground. And so the coach kicks, kicks him off the team. Coach isn't willing to take the liability of him getting injured or getting hurt. And then his dad like gets all upset with him, loses all the relationship they've been building, and this is when his sister said he took a turn. This is when he stopped going to school. He lost all of his work ethic. Grades started to slip. And then this is when his wonderful cousin came into his life. So, Actually, that was a little bit earlier. No, age Isn't 13. It? Is it 13? Age okay. 13. I have 12. Okay. So, yeah, but it's so, still around that time frame. So, Yeah, 12, 13. So this is right after he gets kicked off the football team. Everything he'd been building up with his dad, being the star quarterback of the football team. You know, everything's good in his life. And then it all comes crashing down. Right. And he gets this wonderful role model of his Uncle Mike. And or as it was, Miguel. Miguel. And, and before <laughs> this, you know, his three older brothers all eventually leave the house, leaving only Richie and Ruth to face Julian's rage at this point. So it's only Ruth and Huli and Richie at home dealing with, with angry dad. And so it's sad to see that his relationship with dad crumbles. Yeah. I don't blame the coach because... Well, yeah, that is no the liability. Head, I don't yeah. blame the coach either. But I mean, if if they weren't telling the school or the coaches that he had these problem with his seizures, they weren't aware of it. And to have him drop down in the middle of a you know football game. Well, they probably didn't say anything because they never would have let him play. No. Well, and they all assumed that he would just eventually grow out of it. So you're going from like age six all the way up to age 13 now. And he's still having seizures. I don't. Eventually, I'm assuming he grew out of it because you don't hear much about it in his adult life. Right. But it, it could be one of those things too, where that he still had them, but they're very rare. True. So a or, lot less likely. Well, even, or all the drugs that he was taking either negated them, or just it was just seen as a drug episode versus an epileptic episode. <laughs> That's true. If you know, you drop acid. I mean, he did some crazy stuff. But even those one seizures where he just stops for 15 minutes and doesn't even realize he's having a seizure, you know, yeah. so he could have still haven't been having those in his adult life and just didn't know. Well, and yeah. Still seeing the monsters. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And if you, if you tool that up with acid dropping at the same time, like, yep. 
is it a bad trip or is it just an epileptic seizure? Mm -hmm. A combo of both, man. (laughs) All right, so as uh, Terry said, uh, so he soon gets this other role model in his life to look up to, uh, his cousin Miguel Ramirez, also known as Mike. Uh, Mike was a decorated Green Beret combat veteran who had just come back from Vietnam. And at home, he had hero status. He also had a lot of rage issues, though. And uh, he played those out in Vietnam in in some horrific ways. Uh, He would boast of his gruesome exploits and abuses during the war to Richie. He would share with him Polaroid photos of his victims, including Vietnamese women that he had raped. He uh, had uh, Polaroids showing a woman with a gun to her head performing fellatio on him. That's oral, if you don't know what that is. On him, while he grinned at the camera. And the next photo would be Mike with the decapitated head of the woman that he had just raped. And Richie would later say that he used to get excited by the photos and that he would masturbate while thinking of them. Mike claimed to have decapitated multiple women in Vietnam, and he had several shrunken heads that he kept as mementos, telling Richie that he used them as pillows in Vietnam. That's so disturbing. He He messed up. So disturbing. Yeah. He also... (laughs) um, It gets gets better? Yeah. He also turned Richie onto pot at the age of 10. Uh, They used... That's what I thought. It was used to have 12 out of 10, but... Anyway, he turned Richie onto the age of pot, or onto the age of pot. He turned <laughs> Richie onto pot. And they used to smoke pot together. And then Mike also taught his young cousin some of his military skills, including guerrilla war techniques, such as killing with stealth and how to kill quickly. So while most people saw um, Mike as a war hero, his wife, Jesse, was annoyed that he talked about war crimes and got high with a little kid all day. Mike would eventually get fed up with his wife's nagging, and on May 4th, 1973, Richie was at Mike's house when he noticed that there was a gun in the fridge. When he asked Mike why, he was told it was to keep it cold in case he needed to use it. We all keep our guns which, in the fridge, which right? Which makes sense, because, you know, <laughs> I keep mine in there, because it's just, you gotta be, if you're gonna be kill somebody, be... you gotta be cold-hearted, or it's gotta be like a cool... The gun's gotta be cold. Yeah, I like to keep it by the cri- in the crisper where <laughs> nobody goes. It goes fresh, stays fresh. <laughs> So, maybe it's quieter. I don't know. You don't get quite the recoil, you know, if it's cold. <laughs> God. You don't need the silencer on it. Well, yeah. Well, that way you can just go like, hmm, milk? No. Gun. Gun. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure when you're already messed up in the head, you can tell, like, a kid anything, and he's just going to go, wow, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> and even and, and, and no who's to say they weren't even high? I mean, they probably were high at the time anyway, so. Yeah. So, uh, when uh, wife Jessie comes home from shopping... They begin to argue like they do a lot, and Mike got the gun out of the fridge. Jessie laughed and dared her husband to do it. He raised the gun to her face and shot her point blank in the face while his two kids and Richie were sitting right there watching. He told Richie to get out of there and to say nothing. Richie goes home and doesn't say anything, but his family does notice that he's really withdrawn and he's acting very sullen and quiet. Mike eventually gets arrested and goes to jail. And at some point, uh, Julian and Richie go back to the murder scene to collect some items for Mike. And it was during this trip that Richie would later say that he had had an epiphany. He said that seeing the scene and going through her stuff was almost like a religious experience to him. He said he felt tingly as he opened, as he emptied her purse out and got to go through her stuff. He said he felt connected and like he now owned a part of her. So that's pretty dark. That's the start of his mess up right there. Yeah. Messed in the head. He was trained. This was all. Oh, yeah. Well, you have now head injuries Mm -hmm. and PTSD. Yep. So you're adding all of this stuff on top of it. I think the part that is like the worst of, I mean, this is all really bad. Don't get me wrong. The worst part about all of this is Miguel didn't even go to jail. Nope, he didn't. Uh, He actually pled not guilty by reason of insanity, blaming the trauma that he suffered in Vietnam for his rage. And the jury buys his excuse, and he's committed to the state mental hospital rather than sent to prison. Yeah. So. See, and the the stuff that he did in Vietnam, there was so many blind eyes. They just put their blinders on, let him do what he wanted to do, gave him all these medals, and sent him home. Yeah, and there was... There's a lot of stories of that stuff happening in from Vietnam. Um, and then I don't know. I mean, obviously, like, 
it it's real it happened there's all the stuff right but you know hollywood gets their hands on it and then you now it's it it becomes the point of how real was all of it i mean not not the fact that this stuff doesn't happen because right. it, it it's happened in probably i'm sure every war i would hope that it's a lot more rare than it is the, you know more the exception than the rule i i, I think i would hope so has to believe that because i mean not to go off on the you know the way that vietnam soldiers were treated when they came home but they were they were not popular when they came home Dude. they were Mm-mm. called baby killers and all sorts of stuff like that and and some of it's probably right i'm sure so. some of it were right so but i know several vietnam vets who never would ever yeah you know do anything like that and, and so my uh my old uh nco um, back when I first joined the National Guard, he was a two-time Vietnam vet. He actually volunteered to go back a second time, and he was a double Purple Heart uh, recipient. So there was some rough stuff, but like not everybody was of that mentality either. No, I, th- I, th- yeah, but I think Mike probably had some severe rage issues anyway that would even. <laughs> that would even get him into the point where he would do that, even in, in a wartime situation. Right. It's, still, it's still irritating that oh, it, does. it was point it does. blank. He knew exactly what he was doing and then still didn't even serve time for it. Right. Yeah. Well, and just even looking at that, just imagine seeing that as a little kid amongst all the other things that you've been shown and glorified and stuff. I mean, even showing pornography to kids these days will get you in prison, right? Oh, yeah. So... At this point, it's just like, holy cow, what are you doing to this kid? And I don't want to, you know, be sympathetic to Richard Ramirez by any means, but he he was kind of created, you know? Yeah. Um, So Richie sinks into depression after Mike's sent away. And uh, to cheer him up, his family sends him to L.A. to stay with his brother, Ruben. Uh, over the summer. Because that's a smart thing to do. <laughs> well, his parents didn't know that Ruben was now addicted to heroin and was hanging out in the seediest part of L.A. with other addicts and thieves. Uh, he's now a full-time burglar, and he quickly got Richie in on the thrill of getting stuff for free instead of working for it. Uh, Richie was also enamored with the easy access to sex workers and pornography in L.A., and he spent a lot of time going to X-rated movie theaters. So I didn't know that kids could get into those. I've never gone to one, but I just would think well, that they would have like, "Hey, kid, get out." <laughs> I mean, like if he's if he, I mean, it sounds like they're down off of close to Skid Row at this point in time, or at least in that kind of like neck of the woods type of neighborhood. I'm pretty sure they don't give two crap, two shits no, about it at all. Like, they don't. Hey, you know what? Here's an extra twenty bucks. I'm gonna get my my uh, my nephew. Take care like, of my, my little brother. My little brother's gonna come in here and like right. well, whatever. Yeah, well, I'll take the money. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Yep. He's probably a really sick little 12 year old kid or whatever, however old he was at this point. Uh, when he got back from his trip to LA, uh, he knew that the life that he wanted was what his brother Ruben had. He dropped out of high school, began spending his time focusing on his hobbies, which included hunting. He literally liked sneaking up on, uh, sleeping up on and killing birds, coyotes, and other animals. Uh, he also uh, gets uh, very heavy into horror movies. And here's the funny part. He starts going to Jehovah's Witness classes with his friend, where he first learned about the power of Satan. Yeah, from the Jehovah's so, Witnesses. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I have been to one of their meetings once when I was a missionary. They knock on my door a lot. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure Satan's the bad guy in that church, too. I'm pretty sure it's like... Yeah, I, yes, I would think so. Satan, bad. Jehovah, God, Christ, good. You know? But, you know, like... If you think about it in a super, super twisted way, you could see the 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 power that Satan would have even from the Bible itself. You just got to look in the right path, take, take, take the right pieces out of there, and you can understand what power he has on Earth. They just kind of miss the whole like, well, rest yeah, of the it's story. Like you're missing like the major parts. And maybe it's like, I don't know, is this the same as like how I love Darth Vader and everybody else likes Luke and Han and it's like, forget them. Nonetheless, I digress. <laughs> so uh, anyway, inside jokes on Paramount peeps. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is where he first learned about the power state was the Jehovah's Witness classes. Okay, so when Richie gets back from LA, the life at home with his parents is worse than ever. Ruth had escaped the home by getting married to a man named Roberto. 
And eventually, eventually, Richie moves in with them. Uh, big win for Richie. He's not at home with, with angry Julian anymore. Richie now gets another great role model. Another real winner. He's a real oh. winner. Not as good Ruth, as Mike, though. Ruth describes... Re- oh, not me. I was going to say, wait, what? <laughs> cousin Mike. Cousin, cousin Mike. Mike. Cousin Miguel, okay. Uh, Ruth describes Roberto as oversexed. She had to put out for him every day. And if he didn't, if she didn't, then he wouldn't leave her alone. And it was uh, miserable to make matters worse. After they were done doing the deed, Robert still often wasn't satiated and he would start walking the neighborhood, looking in windows for naked women and other, uh, other people having sex to, to get off further. He quickly takes, uh, makes Richie his peeping Tom partner in crime. Richie is 15 at this point. They go out together. Uh, when they find a show in somebody's window, they stand there in the windows and they masturbate together while watching. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. Um, Richie starts using LSD and also gets into metal music and becomes a huge fan of ACDC. This comes into play later. Are you rocking out? (laughs) Terry's like... I have Highway to Hell in my head right now. She's doing the devil horns. I was thinking Hell's Bells. (laughs) (laughs) Back in Black is where it's at. That's my favorite. And you got... So you got Cousin Mike that taught him... The stealth and the way to kill people. And just gruesome stuff. And then you've got his brother-in-law that taught him how to be a peeping Tom and how to sneak around and be quiet. And to masturbate and, uh, and, 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 to, and to get off on it. Right? So I, these are great role models oh, yeah. for this child. And yet then his dad's just violent. So uh, Roberto gets the boot when she figures out what's going on with him and Richie. Uh, Richie continues being a peeping Tom after Roberto leaves. He starts to level it up and take a step further by entering people's homes and staring at them while they sleep. That's um, so he's no longer just looking in the windows. Now he's going inside and watching them while they sleep. Just standing uh, there. Just, Ruth would later say that... Super Ru- creepy. Right? Uh, Ruth would later say that Richie never slept, that he was up all the time, up all night, all the time. So this is where Richie starts getting into some pretty... Well, I say starts. He already is. <laughs> like, it's just, Getting into it, pretty it just, what? It just like, levels up. Okay? This is also the point where he's been like sleeping in graveyards to stay away from his parents. That's part of the reason why he moved in with his sisters, because he was living out on the streets. And because he didn't want to be at home. So Richie eventually gets a job at a local Holiday Inn. Uh, he's almost immediately gets into trouble because he's in an elevator with the daughter of a guest. And he tells her how pretty she is. Um, he's reprimanded by the manager and told him and told not to flirt with the guests. And I'm sure it wasn't just like a, you're pretty. It was probably very creepy. You're pretty. I don't know. <laughs> Three he months. He has to have said more than just you're pretty. Uh, he has to, to have her. said more. Yo quiero taco. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. Uh, mis sapatos son muy sabrosos. <laughs> My shoes are very tasty. <laughs> We do have people that listen to this podcast that speak Spanish, I, just so you know. What I said was correct. I said, mis sabados son muy sabrosos. My shoes are very tasty. I took Spanish one twice. Okay. Three months after starting, he gets access to a master key, which allows him to enter every room, which is horribly creepy already. He immediately begins robbing rooms. Uh, he enters uh, them after people are asleep. Uh, sometimes he enters the room while the woman's in the shower and then hiding, watchers are come out and get dressed. Uh, he escalates that and he actually tries to rape a guest. Uh, so in a book, uh, she says that she was able to stay calm and just go along with it because she knew that her husband had just stepped out and pick up some food and would be back any minute. Uh, the husband comes back before too much really even happens and beats the crap out of Richie. Yeah. Uh, rightly so. Richie's fired and arrested. Uh, Richie tells his mom and Ruth that the woman had invited him in and the husband was just mad and because he'd found his wife cheating. So mom and Ruth believe him. Uh, the criminal charges were dropped when the couple who lived out of state declined to return and testify against him. They just didn't want to deal with it. So, yeah, so he got he just got fired. He just got let go. So his his childhood friend, Eddie Malam, told the TV show Inside Edition that he started seeing the change in Ricky uh, Ricky Ramirez when he started doing acid, and then he noticed Ricky was stealing a lot and being a peeping Tom. Ricky told Eddie that he was fired from the hotel job because he tried to molest two little kids in an elevator. So that was from his childhood friend said that he was fired for that. Uh, the other one was because I'd heard because of the rape, so attempted rape. That's what I heard too. So so that was in 1975. Okay, he's 15. 
at this point. 15 years old, right? It's the age of my daughter. Yes. I can even imagine her even trying to do any of this stuff at this age. Yeah. I mean, that's your son, essentially. He's Yeah. He's actually younger than her son. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I can't even imagine. And it just shows that there's there are some people out there that that start young and start doing some really, really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So his favorite cousin, Mike is released in 1977 after spending four years in a mental hospital and he and Richie pick up right where they left off. Um, Richie was a complete loner and he only spent time with Mike's. um, And Mike said that he was just preparing for preparing Richie for life in the real world. Cause that's how you live in the real world. Uh, Richard by, uh, by now is an expert thief. He's known around El Paso as dedos or fingers because he would pretty much take anything that wasn't nailed. They down. call him Five Finger Richie. I don't know. Oh, that was his nickname. They was, would okay. call him Five Finger Richie. Uh, Richard dreamed about moving back to L.A. He would fantasize about all the wealthy people he could steal from there and how the sprawling landscape into multiple neighborhoods was and easy freeway access would make every I mean, make all of his thievery so easy to do. Um, at the age of 18, he finally moves to California, where he settles permanently. He doesn't really live a healthy lifestyle. He lives on convenience store food. Lots of hot dogs. Lots of hot dogs and bomb burritos. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, you know, I haven't yeah. run a bomb in a long time. But, uh, you know, he gets him even heavier into drugs, including mainlining cocaine. Uh, his teeth are severely rotted out, and he's known for his severe halitosis. Uh, he lived on Skid Row, living the lifestyle of a low-level criminal, and he also moved around to several flop houses and sleazy hotels, including the infamous Cecil Hotel. So essentially, he was homeless. Yep. Yeah. Well, he even also lived with his brother Ruben for a little while, but Ruben kicked him out because they didn't get along. Not not a good roommate. Yeah. When they lived together, though, when they were robbing house, when they were robbing together, they were making twelve to thirteen hundred dollars a week. In 1970. Just in in thievery. Just in thievery. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money that time, you know, at that time. And well, it depends on who you're robbing. Yeah, depends on who you're robbing. So that there was no need for him to get a job because he was making his money that way. Now, we don't want you to get the impression that crime, you know, pays. Is the way to do it. (laughs) You know, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't last. It it, it has this come, come up and for sure. It does. And we'll get to that. We'll, we'll circle back to that. Drink. Um, his interest in Satan grew and the drugs that he, uh, he did made him feel more and more powerful. He had a $1,500 a week cocaine habit that he paid for, had to pay for. Well, that's why he had to make robberies. 12 to $13, 1300 well, a yeah. week. Silly. <laughs> drugs are expensive. That's a lot of money to put up your nose. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> well, even just, just like, you know, I always, I have my friends that drink or friends that smoke and it's just like, you know, I glad I don't have to pay for that. Yeah. That's crazy expensive, you know. So imagine cocaine and heroin and all these other fun things. So uh, he then adds uh, car theft to his repertoire, and he starts driving the freeways, learning how to navigate them like a pro. He gets into angel dust at this point, and he attempts to rape a woman that he lured with drugs, and then she ca- and so he lures her with drugs. She takes him back to his apartment. Um, she gets wise, kicks him out, but he goes back later that night. And enters uh, back into the apartment through a window that he had unlocked before he left. Because he had planned on coming back if he didn't get what he, he wanted. He watched her sleep for a while before raping her. This was his first successful rape, and he left exhilarated. Uh, that same week, he bought and read the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. And immediately after finishing he, uh, finishing reading it, he stole a car and drove to San Francisco to meet LaVey who recalled him being very nice and very shy. And uh, LeVay even added that, you know, I really liked the kid. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, wow. He didn't even know him. Richard goes back to L.A. and his crimes and his drug use only amplify at this point. His family's worried about him. And he sends Ruth to L- they send Ruth to L.A. to, to uh, check on him. She finally meets him at a downtown L.A. bus terminal. It's like, hey, welcome to L.A. Meet me at the bus terminal in Skid Row. (laughs) She's shocked at his physical decline. Uh, What she notices most, though, is that his eyes are black and hardened. Uh, She doesn't recognize him. She went back to his seedy hotel, and he blasted uh, Highway to Hell. 
There you go. While uh, he told his sister about how Satan had saved his life. <laughs> she tries to convince him to come home. He refuses. She goes back and tells her family what she found, and they pray for change. And obviously didn't work. Uh, he would uh, make his first murder less than a year later. Good so, gracious. Yeah. Yeah. He's how old at this point? Uh, 22, 24 when uh, his first murder. Is so you've been 23 at the, uh, at the end of all of that. Yeah. What a childhood. I mean, that's awful. Yeah. It, it is absolutely amazing that one, he got out of childhood, uh, yeah. for one, <laughs> he lived through it and that he even lived to 23 or yeah. 24 because, um, yeah, you got into angel dust and Coke and, and marijuana and, who knows what else like because pcp was pretty popular back in the 80s uh in that time frame too so i mean there's no telling what concoctions he was using at that point in time and then not eating really anything yeah he was never really given a chance out of life really no but even if he'd had a normal childhood right even with all the just the the brain injuries that he had and even just like i mean i know people who've had abusive uh were abused as kids that turned out very normal yes um, I don't know. It's it's hard to say if he had a different upbringing, how if he would be any different or not. Well, you look at all of the serial killers and the triggers and the markers, which you know causes them to become who they are. Majority of them do have the head injuries, but he had almost every single one of them versus just having like maybe one or two. Yeah, he had all of them. Yeah, bad upbringing, bad you know head injuries, uh, it, childhood abuse. Right. The great role models in and his he life. Was, he was uh, trained by these guys models. how to be a total. You know, instead of just having yeah. like one or two, he had all of them. Yeah, he he never got a good. It seems like he never got a good solid role model. Nope. In his life, and and that I mean, who knows? I mean, that could have been what he needed to get out of it. But I am guessing that by the time he turned fifteen, he was too far gone. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, there was that one little hope when he was on the high school, football, not high school, middle school football team. At 12. Well, at 12. The, yeah, by the time he's 15 working When he at, was having good hotel, grades. He's but, gone. you know, that got shattered so fast for him. But that was like his one glimmer of hope that he had in his life when he was a child. And it just it was went just down. a little blimp and it was over. Yeah. Well, Josh, tell us about his first murder in April yeah. of 84. I think before we get into that, I want to oh, talk yeah. a little bit about some psychology pieces associated to this. Oh yeah. And I think part of it's just because of how we talk in general, right? We use the word, we generally, a lot of times when we talk about people like this, we use the term psycho or psychopath, right? Um, But Richard wasn't a psychopath. So a psychopath is, is actually defined by someone who um, doesn't, or is incapable of feeling normal range of motion of, of emotions, Richard, uh, Mr. Ramirez himself was actually what's considered a sociopath. Um, they're actually able to experience emotions in those pieces. Um, and then like psychopaths, they need to be in control. So like if, when a psychopath commits a murder or, or plans a murder, right? They're very meticulous. They plan where they're going to go in, what they're going to do. Sociopaths are very much more random. So like Ramirez picked his places randomly. He's like, at times he didn't even know what he was going to do. He's like, I got into the house. Yep. Then I decided to kill people. And so that makes it even scarier. The part that I find fascinating by this is sociopaths are not, um, it's not, you're not born a sociopath. So they're actually created by life experiences and manufactured by, by society. You can see he was made. Exactly. You know, and yeah. even here, you can see why some of the people he attacked lived. Some of them died. Yep. It's just whatever he felt like. Exactly. And then then there's one other common thing that he actually has in common with, with, with like BTK and Dahmer. Wait, isn't BTK the, the, Viet, the Korean boy band? <laughs> <laughs> BTS. Oh, BTS. Sorry. <laughs> I digress. Uh and so what happens with some of these serial killers is that right around puberty, right? So yep. what, the age of 12, age of 13? Yep. Sex and violence 
merge and become one. Yep. And so you can see like him talking about this, these, uh, these things, these incidents that happened that actually got him aroused through the violence and stuff. And that that's absolutely terrified, terrifying in itself. So you can kind of see how all of these things, all of these events led to the, you know, to the creation of the night stalker Mm -hmm. and, to his, you know, thrill killing lifestyle that he, he he assumed. Yeah. So that brings us to April tenth, nineteen eighty four. I remember uh, that day. No, I can I don't. I, I remember nineteen eighty four. I was uh, eight. I was six. So I was the same age as him. Oh, you were six. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but we were I born was, the same year. I know, but I'm older than you guys. <laughs> Actually. Remember. All three of us were born the same year. Mike's the old, I'm the, the old, old fart. <laughs> He's the old man in the group. I know. At least I think was like maybe four or three. <laughs> <laughs> One. The thing is, I remember things from '84. I don't know if you guys do. But. I do. Actually, I have some memories of '84. So, the interesting thing about this one is that this is, while it's what is listed as his first official murder in this avenue, it actually didn't get attested to him till later in life. On April 10th, 1984, Ramirez murdered nine-year-old Chinese-American girl, Mei Leung. I have no idea if that was close or not. Sounds good to me. I was going to say Mai Long. Mai Long? Yeah. That's whatever. That's, it's close. In the basement of the apartment building where she was living at, at the time, uh, in the Tenderloin District of San Francisco, Leung was with her eight-year-old brother when she reportedly lost a dollar bill and went to go look for it. To which Ramirez approached Leong and told the girl he knew where it was and to follow him to the basement. Let this be known. Stranger danger. Do not fall strange people into the basement of any building. At any age. Does nobody else think it's funny that there's a tenderloin district in San Francisco? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds delicious. Big district. Uh, the child agreed, and once they were in the basement, Ramirez beat, strangled, and raped Leong before stabbing her to death and hanging her partially nude body from the pipe by her blouse. Um, this was his first known killing, but was not a, connected to the Night Stalker crime spree until 2009 when his DNA was matched to a sample attained at this crime scene. So in 2016, the officials disclosed evidence of the second suspect identified through a DNA sample retrieved from the scene who was believed to have been the, who, who was believed to have been present at Leung's murder. Authorities have not yet publicly identified the suspect uh, he was described as being a juvenile at the time and have not been brought up on charges due to lack of evidence. Um, so that was this. So here he is training somebody else. Yeah. Another Yay. juvenile. So moving on to his next. Uh, well, actually, before we even get to that. Um, so one other thing, we didn't want to talk too much about it, but I did want to tell one story. So back in January, I believe of this year, Netflix came out with a four part series called uh, The Night Stalker. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. I recommend go check it out. Uh, most of it uh, has to do with the police who investigated them all. But um, they do tell the stories pretty good. But there was a, a six-year-old girl named Anastasia Horonis. And she was a survivor. Uh, when she was six years old, Richard came through her window uh, and carried her off. She said that he reminded him of a family member. She reminded her of a family member. And uh, kind of felt familiar, so she thought it was okay. She was groggy, tired. She really didn't know for sure who it was, but it just felt okay. Um, When uh, driving, he told her to open the glove box, and he showed her a gun in the glove box. Uh, He made her look at him and look, like, look at him, wink, wink, and touch him while they were driving. And then they arrived at their destination. By this point, she knew that he wasn't a family When they arrived at their destination, he made her get into a duffel bag. He told her to be quiet and to do what he said. The house was dark and gross. Uh, Garbage was everywhere. Uh, He had Madonna playing over and over. Uh, He raped her several times. Uh, She said that he uh, had a look on his face of, I'm sorry that I'm doing this to you, but not sorry because I'm not going to stop. Um, he would, she kept saying like, I have to go to the bathroom. And so he'd put her on the sink and say, you know, lift her up, put her on the sink and she couldn't go. And so then he'd go back and resume. And then she would just say it again. And he, anyway, um, not to go too much more into detail on it. He did put her back into the, into the duffel bag when they left. 
They drove a while, pulled over near a gas station, and he instructed her to go in there and have them call 911 so your family can come and get you. There were lots of child abductions and molestations that he uh, committed, and you don't hear as much about them because the police decided not to press too many of them. I mean, this girl was amazing. Uh, they, she was able to identify him later after he was caught uh, out of a lineup. Uh, she had, uh, you know, she said that she was willing to go in to testify so they wouldn't happen to any other little girls. Yeah, at the end of the lineup, the police officers asked if any of the witnesses um, had any more questions. And this little girl raises her hand and she goes, do I write the number two or do I spell out the number two? <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, she was like, this is him. There's no denying she was, it. She was a rock star on it. But anyway, there were so many other ones and the police decided not to parade all the children through and put them all through the trial and everything. And so, and they had enough by the time all of the investigation was done that he was going to be convicted and sent to the death cha- death sentence anyway. So there was no need to drag there was these no kids. need yeah. to drag these kids through it. So I just wanted to give you that one story to let you know that it wasn't just adults that he hit. He victimized. We don't even really know, um, and may never know exactly how many. And um, part of the reason why they were able to connect all of the kid abductions and stuff to him was because of his shoe print Mm -hmm. um because you know he wasn't very smart about what the evidence he'd leave behind he'd wear gloves but um so that's how they were able to link that these child abductions were him and not somebody else all right so do you want me to go the next murder since i didn't murder or do you want to do it i'll take it okay go with it so that leads us now to june 28th 1984 um 79-year-old Jenny Vincow was brutally murdered in her apartment in Glasgow Park, uh, Los Angeles. She had been stabbed repeatedly while asleep in her bed, and her throat had her throat was slashed so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. The interesting thing about this one, though, is Ramirez's fingerprint was found on a mesh screen he removed to gain access through the open window. So right. while he was careful in some cases, this shows that as his his just randomness and non-meticulous nature. Cause oh, he just left his well, first part of it makes me wonder if it was just because he was high on cocaine at the time he got high and he went out to go commit robberies. He wasn't even going really to, to harm her. He was just going out to rob stuff and he's there and he's watching her sleep, you know? And then when he finds that there's nothing in the apartment that's worth anything, uh, I mean, she's 79. I mean, you all have 79 year old grandparents or they don't have anything worth really. Some of them don't. Yeah. Anyway, um, so he stares at her while at her sleeping body, and then he gets turned on by taking the only thing she had left of value, which is her life. And uh, those stabbings, um, do, 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 do. we'll go on to, we'll, anyway. So afterwards, do you have more on that? So nope. afterwards, he does what would become a custom for him after his murders. He hangs out for a little while, and he has a snack of whatever food the victims had uh, available, and he just would soak in what he'd done. So he hangs out there at this apartment until 5 a.m., and uh, Vin Cow is found around 1 p.m. the next day when her son showed up with her favorite lunch of chicken McNuggets. Uh, Ramirez's fingerprint, like uh, Josh said, was found on a mesh screen that he'd removed, and uh, he didn't have any priors, and so he wasn't in the system, so there was really no nothing to match the prints on. And this is back before they had, you know, all the computerized stuff, APHIS and all these things where they can, you know, just throw it in the computer system and let the computer sort it out. It would take them so long um, to find a print. It was going. Match. Oh, yeah. It was going on paper cards. And then they have to sit there with their little magnifying mm-hmm. monocle thing. And, you know, you could match maybe four cards in a day going through and just trying to. Yeah. If you, if four in a day, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. It's just like reviewing all those things, trying to find all those markets. I mean, so. Yeah, it's a lot. It was there wasn't a lot to the, to compare him against, and it, he probably did have minor arrests. You know, I think I'd seen that there he'd had some other minor arrests for like thievery or robbery or something like that, just minors. Yeah, but those things wouldn't be in the same kind of a database with a brutal no. murder like this. No, and that's the thing too is that most of that petty stuff would have been probably back in Texas for most of it, and yeah. so even if there was a database of, of fingerprints, like. It wouldn't have been in the National Registry. Because we all know how well, you know, different police stations work together. Right. Yeah. Well, well and that come, we'll get into that a little <laughs> we'll more later. We'll get to that. Yeah. 
So uh, the next murder after Vincao on March 17th, 1985. St. So Patrick's Day. St. Patty's Day. So this is, the other one was June of 84. So he goes like a whole eight months or so uh, without killing anybody that we know of. Um, Richard drives around seeking the only high that could top uh, cocaine for him. And that was killing. He sees 22-year-old Maria Hernandez uh, driving down the road. He follows her home to her apartment in Rosemead, California. When uh, she pushes the button in the garage to close the garage door, uh, Richard ducks under the door, knocking off his ACDC hat in the process. Uh, that's one of the major pieces of uh, evidence, I guess, left behind. He attacks her. He shoots her in the face with a 22 caliber handgun after, you know, after she pulled into the garage. She survived when the bullet actually ricocheted off of the keys that she held in her hands as she, uh, as she lifted them up to protect herself. So she kind of brings her hands up kind of to block you know, in front of her face and, and yeah, it uh, ricochets somehow off of the keys. That's like, what are the odds of that? Pure luck. <laughs> Very and, low. and, and on that, uh, that show on that Netflix show, it actually shows the keys with like the little indentations and stuff in it. Jeez. Um, it's a 22 caliber handgun. So it's not like it's a really high caliber. Nope. But they do have great penetrating power, uh, for those little guys. Um, she survives, like I said, when uh, she protects her hands up, ricochets off the key. She falls down and plays dead, but she's pretty much relatively unhurt. Um, inside the house, her roommate, Dale Yoshi Okazaki, age 34, heard the gunshot and ducked behind a counter when she saw Ramirez enter the kitchen. Uh, he had seen her, and he could also see her hands on the top of the counter. So she's resting there behind the counter, ducking behind it, but her hands are up on the edges. And so he can see her hands, so he knows where she is. Um, he waited on the other side of the counter, and then when she finally raised her head to see where he'd gone, kind of checking for the all clear, uh, he shot her once in the forehead, killing her immediately. Now, Maria, after he'd gone inside, got up and ran around the front door, thinking that she would go, but that he would go back out the same way that he came in. Uh, she and Richie were both very startled and surprised to run into each other as he came running out the front door. He raised the gun to shoot her in the face again, and she pleaded, look, you already shot me once. Don't shoot me again. And uh, and he doesn't. He lets her go, and he runs off. That's just flabbergasting in itself. Right? How lucky is she? Someone argue not great. very. <laughs> great, great Grace of God here. I'm telling you, that's, there's angels involved on this. I mean, granted, with all the horrible stuff that happened there, she's very lucky to be alive. Oh, so lucky to be alive. The fact that she didn't die in the the first shot is is lucky enough. Right. So and so, then and then running into a to him after he already killed somebody, it's like you're thinking you're going down. Yeah, see, and he, he got off on seeing the fear in his victims' faces. That was part of the reason why he sat and waited for her to pick her head up over the table. So he could see her and then like even in when uh, the one who lived, when she got into the garage, he like banged his hand on the car to make her look at him so he to could see her face yeah. to start to startle her because he wanted to see that fear. Yeah, that is just sadistic in itself. So he might have waited eight months between the first and the second, but he only waited 10 days between the next. Actually, time. there was another one within an hour. Oh, I don't have that one. Okay, so within an hour of the Rosemead home invasion, Ramirez pulls 30-year-old Sai Lian, also known as Veronica Yu, out of her car in Monterey Park. And he shot her twice with a twenty two caliber handgun and fled. She was pronounced dead upon arrival at the hospital. Uh, the two murders and attempted third in a single day attracted extensive coverage from news media, who dubbed the attacker described as the curly haired with bulging eyes and wide space rotting teeth as the walk-in killer and the valley intruder. So <laughs> what a nickname. Yeah. Okay. So, so then he still didn't wait very long anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so he waited 10 days after. So after killing two people in March 17th, he waited 10 days. Uh, and on March 27th, Ramirez entered the home that he had burglarized burglar. Burgled. Burgled. We'll go with burgled because that's what's in Atman. Yeah. Burgled a year earlier just outside of Whittier, California at approximately 2 a.m. and killed the sleeping Vincent Charles Zazara, age 64, with a gunshot to his head from 
his 22 caliber handgun. Lazaro's wife, Maxine Levina, age 44, was awakened by the gunshot, and Ramirez beat her, bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While he ransacked the room, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed, which was not loaded. This infuriated Ramirez, and he shot her three times with the twenty-two. then fetched a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times, then poked out her eyes with the knife and placed them in a jewelry box, which he took when he left and kept as, at his apartment as a souvenir until his arrest. Uh, the autopsy determined that the mutilations were post-mortem, and Vincent and Maxine, Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. Ramirez left footprints from a pair of Avia sneakers in the flower bed, which the police photographed and cast. This was virtually the only evidence that police had at the time. Bullets found at the scene were matched to those found at previous attacks, and the police determined that a serial killer was at large. Now, I read in, an, in another account of that that she was also raped, that his wife was raped, and that the stabbing that he did uh, was uh, several times, and it was just on her pelvis, just right above her, her privates there. And then he gouges. And then he burgled the place, right? Then and, he burgled the place. And it was about a $40,000 burgle. So, I mean, that's... That's you know, a lot of that's coke. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of coke. That's like at least a week. That's almost like a year's worth of salary for people back then. Right? Well, and maybe that was enough because his next murder didn't happen until May. So, I mean, at, at bottom, at least a month of... Of cocaine. Of and- cocaine and gas station hot dogs. Um, on May 14th... Yum. On May... <laughs> <laughs> On May 14th, uh, 1985, Ramirez returned to the Monterey Park and entered the home of Bill Doy, age 66, and his disabled wife, Lillian, who was 56. So uh, he goes in, he surprises Doy in the bedroom, and Ramirez shoots him in the face with his 22 semi-automatic pistol. So I keep saying that it was, I keep reading that it was a semi-automatic pistol. And on the show, they, show, they keep saying it was a semi-automatic, but the picture they keep showing is a revolver. And I'm like, there's maybe, there's a difference. Maybe it was fully semi-automatic. Maybe they don't understand the difference between a revolver and a well, semi-automatic. Well, that's like the whole term, full semi, fully semi-automatic. <laughs> Have you heard that one? Yeah. yeah it's just like, yeah. It's a full semi-automatic. Anyway. Um, but he shoots him in the face with his twenty two pistol as uh, Doy went for his own handgun. Now, I hope when somebody breaks into my house that I am fast enough to not be shot while I'm trying to get to my own. Just saying. Um, After beating the mortally wounded man into unconsciousness, uh, Ramirez entered Lillian's bedroom, bound her with thumb cuffs. And now that's a different one, right? Then he raped her after he ransacked the home for valuables. Bill Doy died of his injuries while in the hospital. Um, Bill did manage to call 911 after he was shot. And police did say that by him doing that, he ended up saving Lillian's life. Now, if you don't know anything about guns, uh, guns or ammunition, um, Josh and I could both tell you that shooting somebody with a twenty-two will likely probably piss them off before it will kill them. You, you can kill them, but in the adrenaline thing, you know, it's not got a lot of stopping power, and so it's actually very low caliber. It doesn't get much lower than that, honestly. That's you get into like pellet guns at that point or BB guns. But he did shoot him in the face. Um. So, I mean, like, yeah. So I'm guessing, like, when he says shot in the face, it's like more like in the chin. But he still has to beat him into unconsciousness on, after that. Yeah. And Bill still is able to, while he's attacking his wife, is able to get him, uh, or, you know, to get up and get the phone and, and call dial 911. I mean, I'm sure he's bleeding and losing a lot of blood, but. Oh, I'm sure. Um, I think she had actually just suffered a stroke. Is that why she was listed as disabled? Yeah. And that's why she was in a separate room than he was in. Because she was recovering from a stroke. It's interesting, though. Like, he still bound her. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't I don't know what thumb cuffs are, to be honest. But uh, They show them on the picture. They show them on that <laughs> documentary. And they, and they, they are, are... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. They say they are like little handcuffs, like with a hinge in the middle. And then they do close around your thumbs. So they have like little hinges, the little thing, little, you know, inside part that kind of clicks through. And clicks tight, but they don't go around your wrists. They just go over your thumbs. And and what the point of this is, I'm not 100% sure. 
seems more like a torture device or something teenagers do to their friends. They go, ha ha, I've got the key. <laughs> it's like a Jenny. Be- so yeah. Yeah, like, I can I can post pictures of what these thumb the, cuffs look like if you the, want me the, to. The That'd be cool. That, like those are just weird. The fact that that he has these things is just bizarre. Because I'm sure they weren't in the house. Yeah, he had so. to have had them on hand. I would. He imagine. had to have gotten them someplace. Maybe he got them from his cousin Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. So that's May 14th. Uh, and then we move on to May 29th. Josh. Yep. So on the May, night of May 29th, 1985, uh, Ramirez drove a stolen car to Monrovia, uh, which is in Europe, by the way. Um, or it's in it's also a suburb of L.A. Did he travel by map? <laughs> he traveled by, <laughs> map. by map. Like the Muppets do. <laughs> exactly. Traveled by map. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, Wish we could have done that tonight. <laughs> uh, he stopped at the house of Mabel Ma Bell. Uh, age 83, and her disabled sister, Florence Nettie Lang, age 81. Finding a hammer in the kitchen, he bludgeoned and bound Lang Lang in her bedroom and then bound and bludgeoned Belle before using an electric cord to shock the women. After raping Lang, he used Belle's lipstick to draw the satanic pentagram symbol on her thigh as well as the walls of both bedrooms. The women were found two days later alive, but comatose and critically injured. Uh, Bell later died of her injuries in the hospital. Isn't it, isn't it kind of chicken that he's like picking on older he's people? He's picking on these older, like, yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know if he does that on purpose or if it's just these are the people it's, that didn't lock their doors. I think it's just opportunity. Yeah. The random house that he just decides to walk in that night. I know uh, in the 80s, a lot of people didn't lock their doors. I mean, I, no. mean I, remember, I remember we used to go visit grandma. We just make sure the screen door was shut so the dog didn't get out. And you might lock, you might latch the screen door. You know, had that little like that little cheesy, like little click lock that, you know, didn't really do a whole lot. But yeah, there wasn't a lot of security going on back in these days. No, so. no, not mm-hmm. at all. The thing that is like crazy about this is the shocking with the electrical cord. Yeah. yeah. Like, like if you've ever been shocked by a like an outlet, it hurts. A little and is annoying more than that but like that's like straight up just sadistic torture that's like mm-hmm. watching stuff out of like you know probably learned it from uncle mike cousin mike <laughs> probably <laughs> we're gonna blame everything on uncle mike uh, why not the guy's a freaking no, cousin mike, not uncle monster mike. so uh the next day ramirez drove the same car to burbank another neighborhood in the la area and sneaked into the home of carol kyle who was age 42 so finally he's picking somebody a little younger um, at gunpoint, he binds Kyle and her 11-year-old son with handcuffs, and then he ransacks the house. Uh, he released Kyle to direct him where the family's valuables were, and then he raped her repeatedly. Ramirez also uh, repeatedly ordered her not to look at him, telling her at one point that he would cut her eyes out. And I believe that because he already has. Yeah. Uh, he fled the scene after retrieving the child from the closet. At least he put the kid in the closet, didn't make him watch. Um, and binding the two together again with handcuffs. So they survived time, at least they survived, they but they were still attacked. And that's one of the weird th- the things that you're going to find with all these is some people lived, some people died. He just it depended on his mood at the moment. Kind of just made it up as he went, which is even more disturbing. I and cause you think like there was no rhyme or reason to anything he did at no. all. No, no, nope. none. It's so, uh, which is the 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 the, the pattern of a uh, of a sociopath? Is exactly. That they're just going to make it up as they go. Just like you explained earlier, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So on June twenty seventh, uh, nineteen eighty five, thirty two year old Patty Elaine Higgins was murdered in her Arcadia home. The crime was not discovered until July second, when she did not show up for work. Her attacker had sodomized her, strangled her, and slashed her throat. Awesome. And she was one who would leave her door unlocked. And because of all these murders that were happening, her kids were asking her to lock her door and saying, Mom, please lock your door. And she refused to. She was like, I'm not going to change the way I live my life. I don't have anything to be afraid of. And look what happened. Yeah. And and the thing is, like, you know, the papers, the news channels, everybody was covering these murders because there were so many of them in a, such a short period of time. Yeah. And I mean, even, even there's another one that happened uh, somewhere in that same I'm assuming that same week. I don't have the exact date on it, but it was before um, his July 2nd. Um, so after an attempted kidnapping of a little girl on the street, 
Uh, Ramirez uh, fled the scene and in doing so committed a traffic violation. This was seen by a motorcycle motorcycle cop and he pulls the car or uh, the Toyota over. Uh, the driver has no driver's license and is pulled from the car to be searched. Hands on the hood, the driver is patted down and he has no weapons on him. The officer returns to his bike to get his citation book. And while that's going on, Ramirez hears the broadcast over the police radio about the attempted kidnapping and the description of the car and the person. He draws a pentagram on the hood of the, on the hood. And actually it looks like a, on the video, it showed a picture of it on the, the window. It was like a, on a dirty window. Uh-huh. Uh, but he draws a picture with it on the, on the car with the pentagram. And then he flees on foot while the officer's back was turned. Didn't the officer even ask him jokingly, are you the one committing all these murders around California? I didn't, I didn't hear that. I think he did. While he was doing this, he was joking and actually kind of made the comment. Are you? Yeah. yeah. I didn't hear that part. Yeah. He kind of joked with him and asked him if he was the killer of all these. And he, he, so, he was. <laughs> so the, the officer's back there his motorcycle and uh, comes back. Of course, the car is stolen. Uh, and uh, the guy's fled on foot. He's gone. So the officers take the car back to their impound lot and the detectives working on the stalker case, uh, which I forget the one of them was Frank Salerno. The other one was named Gil. Um, but uh, they asked for the car to be held so that they can collect prints because, I mean, they have had his hands on the hood. The local cops said that they would do it, but they never did. And they would never allow Gil and Frank to come back to their yard because it was like, this is our territory. This is our murder suspect. Uh, Gil Carrillo. That was his name. Thanks, Terry. Um, they wouldn't allow them anywhere near it. Uh, with handprints on the car, they could have gotten the prints of the driver, but it was a missed opportunity due to the hot-headed territorial stupidity between agencies. Um, uh, by the time that they did finally get to it, uh, the heat had been sitting in the impound lot for months, and the heat of the sun had basically just baked away any any chance of collecting uh, fingerprints from it. Um, at all the scenes, they figured that the suspect wore gloves because they really didn't find any fingerprints that were left behind. So, now, how many of these serial killers back then could have been caught so much sooner? If the agencies, if actually, the worked agencies together? actually worked together and weren't hot headed, yeah, and that I mean, a lot actually. Like some of the people, like, uh, like Green River, and um, I would bet you Bundy, would, Bundy. I would even bet like Zodiac. Yep. Might have been caught earlier had like these agencies, you know, had the the the, the stuff in place where they communicate. Mm-hmm. You know, even well, now though, it still happens that like, they don't necessarily communicate with each other. They like do they a little bit more now than they did back then, but they were saying how many districts did could he get through? Oh, they said in five in a five minute drive you could cross through three different jurisdictions. Jurisdictions. Yeah, and that's the problem with big cities, right? Yeah. W- uh, unlike. And none of them want to, yeah, none of them want to share. Yeah. Unlike now, like, uh, Salt Lake has unified. Yeah. So, like, well, they're all under used one. Used to, although most of them, a lot of them are separating <laughs> back out again. <laughs> but they do work together. Right. And that's the thing is, is, since then, there's been laws that have been passed, and there's a lot of working together and supporting each other and, uh, and helping each other out. So, uh, Josh, tell us about July 2nd. So, on the night of July 2nd, he drove another stolen car uh, to Arcadia. And randomly selected the house of Mary Lou- Louise Cannon, uh, age 75, a widowed grandmother. Um, after quietly entering Cannon's home, he found her asleep in the bedroom. He bludgeoned her into unconsciousness, which she was already unconscious when he got there, uh, with a <laughs> lamp, and then repeatedly stabbed her in the head, neck, and chest with a 10 inch butcher knife from her kitchen. Uh, and then she was found dead at the scene. See, so no rape this time, no burgling. Well, maybe there was, I don't know. Yeah, it didn't but say, but it's just vicious. So then, a couple days later, on July fifth, nineteen eighty five, Ramirez breaks into the home of in Sierra Madre and bludgeons sixteen year old Whitney Bennett with a tire iron as she slept in her bedroom. After searching in vain for a knife in the kitchen, Ramirez attempted to strangle the girl with a telephone cord. He stated that he was startled to see electrical sparks emanate from the cord, and I would be from a phone cord. That would be surprising too. I would be uh-huh. shocked. And uh, when his victim began to breathe, he fled the house, believing that Jesus Christ had intervened and saved her. Bennett survived the savage beating, although 478 stitches were required to close the lacerations to her scalp. That is a lot. She's basically scalped. Yeah. So isn't it interesting that he's a Satanist and all about the power of Satan, but he runs away when the power of Jesus Christ saves a girl? 
Yep. Just saying. <laughs> yeah. July, uh, this week of July, I think was his... Uh, well, it's a busy week. Is it a busy week? Uh, so on July 7th, another two days later... Oh, I got one more on the 6th. Uh, oh, my gosh. That's even worse. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll go with this one then. On July 6th... He was celebrating his independence. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the fireworks just got him going. Ramirez attempted to enter the home of a young sheriff deputy and his family. The wife was awakened by the noise, and her husband investigated outside one of the windows, and or outside, and outside one of the windows was a pair of perfectly imprinted footprints that matched uh, so many of the murders so far. Uh, the windows had recently been painted, and they were stuck. He really hadn't had the time to kind of take a knife in and separate the paint on them. And I'm thinking L.A. in the summertime, July... Had been miserably hot in that house. Oh, so bad. But um, who knows? Anyway, um, the deputy had put a box over the prints to preserve them until investigators arrived. And it was noted that they did, in fact, match the other now infamous shoe prints. That was Avea? The brand of shoes? Yeah, Avea. The Avea. The Avea Avea shoes. They were were Aveas. They were not basketball shoes. They were a cross trainer, like an aerobic shoe. They were black aerobic shoes. Yeah. And... And they had figured out that only one pair was sold in California. So yeah, so they they, they measured the width, they, the, the, the size yeah. and the and the type of shoe it was. Only what, nine were manufactured. So there were f- uh, six oh, manufactured, six. and uh, f- they're in that size and of that shoe. And they knew that it was black from the descriptions that people who'd seen them. So um, five went to Arizona. Five went to Arizona, and, and only one, one went to LA. Went to LA, but they really <laughs> didn't have any. Anything beyond that, as far as they couldn't know, track where it was sold it or was who sold bought it anything. or anything like that. But. but it tells you that if there is these shoes, it's the same guy. So they they held that That's shoe amazing. really close to them. And did they, not they let they that didn't out. Divulge that it was. It comes out later by a freaking idiot. Well, it, which we'll divulge. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> I have nothing to say. Good to say about her. <laughs> Uh, so okay, yeah. I don't. I don't have any of the failed okay. attempts or any of the non-murders. That I only have his uh, mm. most right, most heinous. Okay, well, tell Run us about July the very next day, yeah. Josh. So the very next day. <laughs> so like he had a really busy three days. I mean, it could have been a really busy three day weekend for him. Yeah. Um. So on July seventh, Ramirez burglarized the home of Joyce Louis, uh, Lucille Nelson, age sixty, in Monterey Park. Finding her asleep on her living room couch, he beat her to death unarmed by punching her in the head and stomach or and stomping on her face repeatedly. Uh, a shoe print from the Avia sneaker was left imprinted on her face. Uh, and after crushing two other cruisers, crushing, holy cow. After cruising two other neighborhoods, he returned to Monterey Park and chose the home of Sophia Dickerman, age 63. Ramirez assaulted and handcuffed Dickerman at gunpoint, attempting to rape her and stole her jewelry. When he swore, uh, when she swore to him that she, that he had taken everything of value, he told her swear on Satan. And at that point, I'll say anything they wanted to say. Just leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Right. On July 20th. So this is just uh, two weeks later. Uh, Ramirez purchased a machete before driving a stolen Toyota. He seems like he goes with Toyotas a lot. Maybe they're just easier to steal back Maybe. I don't know. Uh, Driving a stolen Toyota to Glendale, California, he chose the home of Leela Needing, age 66, and her husband, Maxon, who was 68. He burst into the uh, sleeping couple's bedroom and hacked them with a machete and then killed them with the shots, uh, with shots to the head from his 22 caliber handgun. He further mutilated their bodies with the machete before robbing the house of valuables. After quickly fencing the stolen items from the Needing residence, Ramirez drove to Sun Valley. And do you want me to go to the next one on it? Same uh, night? Oh, I'm out. Okay. So then at approximately 4.15 a.m., he broke into the home of the Covenath, Covenanth family. So hard names. The first name, I'm going to brutalize it too. I'm sorry. He shot the sleeping Chainarong Covenanth in the head with a 25 caliber handgun. So this is a different caliber. New handgun. New handgun. Killing him instantly. Um, so he shoots him in the head with a 25 caliber handgun, kills him instantly, then repeatedly raped and beat Somkid Kovanath. Um, he bound the couple's eight-year-old son before dragging Somkid, that's the, that's the mom, around the house to reveal the location of any valuable items, which he stole. 
During his assault, he demanded that she swear to Satan that she was not hiding any money from him. And uh, they actually played uh, her describing it and uh, because he didn't kill her. He killed dad, husband, but the mom and the kid survived. And uh, she talked about how he's just, she kept saying, I swear to God, there's nothing here. I swear. And he's like, swear to Satan. She's like, I swear to Satan. And anyway, um, yeah. So one of the interesting things about this one is these, uh, these casings, and it would come into play later, uh, the 25 caliber casings, they figured that they were old because the primer in the middle had a red center. There's a red dot in the a, middle. A big red primer, which is something that was very rare. Huh. And so when they're finding these uh, shell casings at the crime scenes, they're noticing, well, wait, it's not a 22 anymore. Where did that one go? And now they have kind of a very unique um, shell casing. Um, I was going to say, I've never heard of a 25. I haven't either. Yeah. So I don't even... It's not like a common thing, which... No, usually it's like now, I mean, nowadays right, it's a 22 and then goes to 9 mil. Or 380. Or and 380 and then 9 mil and then, yeah. Anyway. But yeah, oh, and everybody has a 9. Yeah. And I don't blame them because they're just a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, I love this next story. Okay. On August 6, 1985, Ramirez drove to the to Northridge and broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He crept into the bedroom, startled Virginia, who was 27, and shot her in the face with a 25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. Then he shot Chris in the neck and attempted to flee. Chris fought back while avoiding being hit by two more shots during the struggle before Ramirez managed to escape. The couple survived their injuries. He shot both of these. He shot them both in the face. And they both... Well, her in the face, him in the neck, and they yeah, both survived. They both survived and chased him out of their house, and he ran away. Well, these, are, <laughs> these are really small that's caliber some, handguns that's for one. badass people, though. Like, right? But think of the shock, though. Like but, if, if you get shot, like... Yeah. The That's adrenaline, the, well, not only that, the adrenaline going through your through your body of being shot, having somebody break into your house. But these people are also young. I mean, she was twenty seven. I don't have the age of Chris. I don't either. But don't um, either. but if he, if she was twenty seven, he had to be close around the same age where he's been hitting a lot of seventy eighty year olds. So I, these people are rock stars in well, my these, mind. <laughs> seventy eight year olds can't get up and go chase him out most of the time. No, no. But I mean, Bill 20, Doy tried. These 27-year-olds can, though. Yeah. So, and then on August 8th, two days later, Ramar, Ramirez drives a stolen car to Diamond Bar, California. And, uh, which is the interesting about Diamond Bar is it was uh, actually just the next neighborhood over. It's like a three-minute drive from Gil Carrillo's house. So Gil, getting Gil really Carrillo close is to the, home. Uh, the detective that's tracking him. He's the nemesis, right? So he's just in his backyard. Yeah. yeah. So he gets the call, and then he tells his wife's like and she at that point when he leaves to go on the call to diamond bar she packs up the kids and everything and they leave and they go to her mom's house yeah, somewhere she says it's town. not safe i'm not gonna live here anymore until yeah. this guy's caught so she left to go live with her family so august 8th 1985 ramirez drove a stolen car to diamond bar california and chose the home of sakina abawath who was age 27 and her husband elias abawath who was 31 sometime after 2 30 a.m he entered the house and went into the master bedroom he instantly killed with killed the sleeping Elias, who was shot in the head from a twenty five caliber handgun. He, can, he handcuffed Sakina uh, while forcing her to reveal the location of the family's jewelry and then brutally raped her. He repeatedly demanded that she swear on Satan that she would not scream during his assaults. When the couple's three-year-old son entered the room, Ramirez tied the child up and continued to rape Sakina. After Ramirez left the home, Sakina untied her son and sent him to the neighbors for help. Uh, Ram- so go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's just like, it's just amazing that he let them live in that avenue. Well, yeah. And it sounds like most of these things were eventually, they were all started out as burglaries. He yeah, was looking home for invasion. valuables. He wanted, he wanted to, to, to rob them. And then it's like, okay. So, yeah, oh, go yeah. for it. So, uh, August 18th, uh, Ramirez, who had been uh, following the media coverage of his crime, left L.A. and headed to San Francisco. So, on August 15th, he entered the home of Peter and Barbara Pan. Uh, not related. Oh, my gosh. Oh, when I was watching this. Peter and Barbara. So, he killed Peter he Pan. He killed Peter when Pan. When I was watching this the other night, Terry kept teasing me. But I'm like, shut up. I'm trying to be serious here. This is serious stuff. 
<laughs> we're sitting there watching it, and I turned to my daughter. I'm like, he killed Peter Pan. And she's like, I thought he would never grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because he was. Could you imagine if it was, it was 66. Peter? Could you imagine if it was Peter and Wendy Pan? Right. Jeez. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Now we're, we're we're laughing about this and joking. But, you know, sometimes Sorry. you kind of have to make light of things to be able to process it. These oh, are, but, yeah. Epic, these are so. yeah. these are awful. So please understand that as we joke and laugh about things, it's it's none of this is funny. No. But we we have to kind of laugh to be able to process it. Yeah, because it's otherwise we would all just sit here and just it would weep. Be depressing. We would just sit here and cry in a home. And a, you a, guys won't listen month. to it ever again. No. Okay. Um, so he shot uh, Peter, age 66, in the temple with the, with his twenty five caliber handgun, uh, which killed him instantly. He then beat and sexually assaulted Barbara, age 62, before shooting her in the head and leaving her for dead. At the crime scene, Ramirez used lipstick to scrawl a pentagram and the phrase Jack the Knife on the bedroom wall. Uh, Ramirez again left the shoe print at the scene, and the detective discovered and matched to a specific Avia shoe that wasn't common at the time. Upon the de- de- detective's discovery of the make in the U.S. Distribu- or distribution of Ramirez Avia shoes, it was found that only six of them existed in size 11 and a half, with five of them shipped to Arizona and one shipped to L.A., which we've covered yeah, already. Yeah, um, it was evident that one of the pairs, one pair of its size and kind in the state of California that belonged to Richard. When it was discovered that the ballistics in the shoe print evidence from the L.A. crime scenes matched the Pan crime scene, San Francisco's then mayor, idiot, Diane Feinstein. Oh, those are words for that one. <laughs> um, I still don't like her. She ended up divulging the information, including the gun caliber, in a televised press conference. This leak infuriated the detec- detectives of the case as they knew the killer would be following media oh, coverage. He followed it because, like, it's when the one guy called nine one one and saved his wife's life, he began cutting the cords and ripping out the phones so people couldn't make phone calls. Right. He followed it closely, so he was aware. He knew what, what was going he knew on. What was going on? Yeah. Um. So this gave him the opportunity to destroy crucial forensic evidence. Uh, Ramirez, who who had indeed, of course, been watching. Uh, dropped his size 11 and a half of Via sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge at night, uh, then remained in the area for a few more days before heading back to L.A. They had, I mean, they caught his sneaker print on a blood f- footprint on a blanket at one of the, of the scenes. They caught his shoe print on the top of a uh, alarm clock. the alarm clock because yeah. he had stepped on the alarm clock to rip the cord out of the alarm clock to use to strangle somebody. I mean, this shoe was so critical in everything and she just put it out there this is why politicians should never be involved in anything <laughs> no. related to no any ops and if those and the military sh- i take that a step further they should never be involved in anything <laughs> <laughs> period but yeah it and so he just went and threw them over the bridge and those shoes never been found uh, never will be uh, found they're no they're probably gone. long gone to the ocean long for- gone yeah, and the only reason why they know where it went because he would have had to have told them afterwards. Yeah, what he happened told them to afterwards the that he tossed oh, yeah. them over the but bridge. But she also mentioned the, the caliber of the gun, which was something that was very specific as well. You're talking about two rare things. Yep. Yeah. You have a 25 caliber handgun, which they're not common, and you have a pair of shoes that only one exists in the state of California, and releasing that information out into the public. Yeah. Like if 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 you told me that, like I was doing a bunch of stupid crap. Of course, I'm going to dump my shoes, and then I'm going to go buy a pair of Nikes because everybody's got a yep. pair of Nikes, yep. and yep. then I'm not going to worry about it. I'm right. sure that her intention was that people are going to go, oh, that guy's got a 25 caliber handgun. Or, oh, look at those shoes. Those are those shoes that the killer's supposed to be wearing. Because everybody pays attention to everybody's shoes. I, I sure do. Oh, Forrest, well, Forrest Gump pays attention to shoes. Well, when you walk into a bathroom, you have to look under the stall to make somebody sure somebody's there. But beyond that, I don't pay attention to shoes. If you go in the bathroom and you, you see black of your shoes in the stall, would you go in there? No. I don't know how bad I have to go. I'll just, I'll just crap my pants. But I'm even go, still, I'm even, leave. even still, they're just saying it was an Avea shoe. They didn't say like the brand, like if it was an aerobic shoe or a coach's shoe or a track shoe. I, I thought shoe. they showed a picture of them. I don't know. Did they show a picture of them? I think she showed a picture because on the press conference, the video of the press conference, she's showing a picture of the of the okay. uh, sketch. They're showing pictures of the. She's showing pictures. And then you of go to these everybody. Things. Can I look at the bottom of your shoe, please? I want to see the print. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ugh. So, 
On August 24th, 1985, so this is uh, just a couple days after, he comes. He goes back to, uh, to L.A. And then on August 24th, he travels 76 miles south of L.A. in a stolen orange Toyota to Mission Viejo. That night, he arrived at the home of James Romero Jr., who had just returned from a family vacation to Rosary- Rosarito Beach in Mexico. Romero's son, 13-year-old James Romero III, happened to be awake and heard Ramirez's footsteps outside the house. Thinking there was a prowler, James went to wake his parents and Ramirez fled the scene. James raced outside and noted the color, make, and style of the car, as well as the partial license plate number. Romero contacted the police with this information, believing that James had chased away a thief. So after this encounter, uh, Ramirez broke into the house of Bill Carnes, age 30, and his fiancée, Inez Erickson, age 29, through a back door. Ramirez entered the sleeping couple's bedroom and awakened Carnes when he cocked his 25 caliber handgun. He shot Carnes three times in the head before, re- before turning his attention to Erickson. Ramirez told her that he was the Night Stalker. Because the news is... And there was, a, on, the, on the documentary, there was a news reporter who was relentless about showing up at all the places and divulging things she was like i'm gonna run with the story unless you give me something just stupid media that has to be that wants the story wants the story it's like yeah we gotta keep things quiet the media had found out about the shoot earlier and was going to release that information and they kind of blackmailed the detectives to get other information to be released and didn't release they didn't release the shoes at that point but they released other information so these these media people were just right on the tail of the detectives through all of it so and that's where he learned that he would that somebody one of them had coined the term night stalker and he liked that so he said tell her tell her it was the night stalker and he forced her to swear that he to swear she loved satan as he beat her with his fists around her with beat her with his fist and bound her with neckties from the closet after stealing what he could find ramirez dragged erickson to another room before raping her then he demanded cash and more jewelry and made her swear on Satan that there was no more. Before leaving the home, Ramirez told Erickson, tell them the Night Stalker was here. Erickson untied herself and went to a neighbor's house to get help for her severely injured fiancé. Surgeons removed two of the bullets from his head and he survived his injuries. Damn. So- Erickson gave a detailed description of the assailant to investigators and police obtained a cast of Ramirez's footprint from the Romero house. The stolen car was found abandoned on August 28th in Wilshire Center, L.A., and police obtained a single fingerprint from the rearview mirror despite Ramirez's careful efforts to wipe the car clean of his prints. The print was positively identified as belonging to Ramirez, who was described as a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a long rap sheet That included many arrests for traffic and illegal drug violations. And then on August 29th, uh, 1985, law enforcement officials decided to release a mugshot of Ramirez from 1984 arrest for an auto theft to the media. And the Night Stalker finally had a face. At the police press conference, it was announced, we know who you are now and soon everybody else will. There will be no place for you to hide. Now, something else that was interesting that they came out, they actually interviewed a guy that was in San Francisco, and the San Francisco police uh, went up there to shake this guy down. They determined that the um, the handgun, they went and asked somebody who was a, an expert about the handguns, and they kind of narrowed down that the handgun might have been sold to him by this guy, I forget his name, uh, but you probably remember what I'm talking about. So the police go and they shake him down. He's like, where did he get the handgun? You know, where did it go? And... He wouldn't tell him, and he was just, you know, F you, I'm not telling you anything. And the guy, the cop reaches from the back seat, kind of punches him in the face, just kind of roughing the guy up. And he's like, is that all you got? And so the guy, like, the cop reaches back even further, uh, almost by the windshield, reaches back, and I was about to hit him. And the guy throws his hands up and goes, Richie Ramirez. And so they had a name. And because there was the bracelet that yeah, led him. Yeah, that's what it was. That's what it was. It was a bracelet that... Uh, that had been stolen. Yeah, there was a bracelet that had been stolen, and then they tracked the serial number to the original owner. It had been stolen from the San Francisco murder. Yeah. And then they were able to link that to the other person that he got the, the handgun from. Sold it to, yeah. yeah. And, and so they all of a sudden had a name, but the San Francisco police wanted to run with it. And the L.A. police were like, we can catch this guy. Give us like two more days, and we'll have him in custody. 
And the San Francisco police are like, we're going with it. And so they ended up doing a joint press conference. Well, it was simultaneous press conference going on at the same time, releasing all the information. And um, and the, the LA cops, they didn't want to do that. They were just like, if we put too much out there, he's going he's gonna to go into the wind and he's going to be gone. Because they were so close. And what's funny is he didn't. He didn't. And you got to wonder if that's part of like getting to the point of a super narcissistic person where they're like, I'm never going to get caught. Or did he just not care and wanted to get caught? Well, it was actually kind of by accident. Do you have the stuff on his comments capture? Okay. So on August 30th, 1985, so this is just a couple days later, Ramirez took a bus to Tucson, Arizona to visit his brother. Unaware that he had become the lead story in virtually every major newspaper and television program across California and even the, the country. Um, they were showing chip clips of like uh, Connie Chung and all these big national heads. Anyway, um, after failing to meet his brother, he returned to Los Angeles early in the morning of August 31st. He walked past police officers who were staking out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee on an outbound bus. And he ran into a convenience store. So he comes back. They're waiting to see if he's going to jump on an outbound bus to flee. He comes in the arrivals, sees the cops there in their... They were undercover cops as homeless people, but you could... When you're homeless, you can tell who the cops are because they've got... Yeah. He, He was able to identify them as cops because... They had clean hair. They had clean clothes. They had even, white teeth. They had white teeth. <laughs> You're like all these, you know, triggers of they being didn't homeless reek. didn't have, other right. than just being in like normal clothes, trying clothes to be whatever, homeless. <laughs> yeah, with quotation could, marks. Tell it was an act because they didn't smell bad. Yeah, they didn't. They weren't gross. And so he's like, he didn't know what they were there for. He didn't know they were there for him. But he's like, eh, I'm just gonna go back out. So he ends up turning around, heading back out the door, and they're kind of watching the other doors. And he goes to a convenience store in East L.A. Uh, After noticing a group of elderly Mexican women fearfully identifying him as El Matador, the killer, Ramirez saw his face on the front pages on the newspaper rack and it hit him. He's like, "Uh oh, (laughs) they know who I am. And he fled the store in a panic. After running across the Santa Ana freeway, he attempted to carjack a woman but was chased away by bystanders who pursued him. And at this point, the cops are chasing him as well. They've got the police helicopters up there. They're watching him run across the freeway from the air, but the ground cops are still having trouble trying to get there to where he's going. Well, and that makes sense. And he was quick. He was quick. That was one of the things that Terry and I were talking about. He was a fast runner. Um, The way that he fled and stuff. Um, So after he attempted to carjack, one was chased away by bystanders who pursued him after hopping over several fences and attempting two more carjackings. He was eventually subdued by a group of residents, one of whom whom had struck him over the head with a metal bar in the pursuit. The group held Ramirez down and relentlessly beat him until the police arrived and took him into custody. And they said that uh, he had a a look of like, oh, good, here come the cops. Save me. He He was tired. He put almost the whole entire state of California in fear, like the increased sales of guns, the increase um, of people taking self-defense courses, karate classes, like... Everybody in California was just in a frenzy because they never knew who he was going after next. It could have been anybody. Yeah. And and, and they're not going to know where he's going to, right? Right. And yeah. so once they knew who he was, I'm not surprised that the you know, residents and just... And, and it speaks something to the to the residents as well. I mean, these were poorer areas. I mean, they were... they the Watching the videos of where he was you know, arrested and stuff, it was poorer areas. They were all uh, kind of... Uh, anyway... But people, it was but people get tired of being a victim, get, right? Of being potential victims. Was, so it really, kind of ended up being like a citizen's yeah. arrest, honestly. Oh, totally. And in fact, the cops probably saved his life, honestly. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that he'd have been lynched. <laughs> um, and it was just—it's cool that the citizens all came together and were not going to stand for it anymore once they knew who he was. Um, so going to the trial and the convictions, a jury selection for the trial began on uh, July 22nd, 1988. It always makes me mad how long it takes for all the stuff to finally go to trial. It takes a long time. It's ridiculous. Yeah, because he was what, from March to August. So, well, this is... Uh, no, I'm just saying he his reign of terror was from March to August. Yeah, March. Little, and, and all in, yeah. A little and, over a year. Yeah, right. In 85. And then he got arrested in 85, and it wasn't until 88. July 22nd, <laughs> Almost 88. Almost two years, what, three years? His first court appearance. Yeah, how many years later? 
three. Three years later yep. to get him to his first court appearance. So his first court appearance is on in July twenty second, eighty eight. Ramirez raised his hand with a pentagram drawn on it and yelled, "Hail Satan!" On August third, eighty eight, uh, the Los Angeles Times reported that some jail employees overheard Ramirez sh- planning to shoot the prosecutor with a gun, which Ramirez intended to have smuggled into the courtroom. By all of his adoring fans, oh the women the, loved him. The groupies, oh, he had the so groupies many. he had, and the photos that he got sent to him in the mail, and just oh, it was, it's amazing because there was just countless letters and like, and he even got, uh, I think he was even dating somebody in, yeah. in like several got, people in he prison. Got, didn't he get married? Yeah, he did get married to Doreen. I've got that, I've got that later. Doreen yeah. Loy. But yeah, I mean, like all of this stuff, right? And like. I mean, I, I I know there's like a phenomenon with it where where women get attached well, yeah. to these violent killers and stuff, but it's it's, it's called it's, hy- ins- it's insane. It's called we'll hybristophilia. See. Yeah, and he which went is a sexual interest in and an attraction to those who commit crimes. Yeah, and so he went from like this kid who never had a boyfriend, <laughs> not a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, he probably didn't have a boyfriend either. He might have. We don't know. He never had a girlfriend. Never was ever in a relationship. He had to rape and just force himself on all these women. And all of a sudden, he's got all these girls forcing themselves on him. But he never got any of them. Nope. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know if he would know what to do Other with, than the, his, with, a, with well, a, a positive sexual experience. He probably wouldn't know what to yeah. do. It, wouldn't, it yeah. wouldn't work for him. He has to have that power, violence that, and power on the it. The thrill to it, yeah. Um, but uh, going back to that trial, let's see here to do... So consequently, a metal detector uh, was installed outside the courtroom, and intensive searches were conducted on people entering. They weren't going to let a gun in. Which probably would have been one of the first like instances of putting a metal detector right. in a courthouse and like searching people coming in, because uh, uh-huh. that was not common practice back nope. in the 80s. So the, the prosecutors actually didn't want Ramirez's attorneys to be his defense attorneys. They were, inex- they were pretty inexperienced. They were from uh, Texas. They were hired by his family, Julian and uh, Mercedes, and you would think that they would say, "Oh yeah, you're inexperienced. That means that you're gonna mess it up. You know, you're not gonna be able to defend him, right?" But they were so concerned that there would that they would screw up the defense and that there would be a mistrial declared, and then all of that stuff that was presented now goes out the window. And so they were. Very concerned and very upset. They did not want his lawyers to be the ones to do it because they were afraid he was going to... It's kind of a game, right? They they were afraid that they were going to mess it up and that they were that their prosecution was just going to get thrown out because his lawyers were inept. Uh, but they were allowed and they actually did a decent job considering, you know... What you got to defend? What they had to defend, yeah. Um, on August 14th, the trial was interrupted because one of the jurors, Phyllis Singletary... Did not arrive at the courtroom. Later that day, she was found shot to death in her apartment. The jury was terrified, uh, wondering if Ramirez had somehow directed his this event from inside his prison cell and whether or not he could reach the other jurors. Um, however, it was ultimately determined that Ramirez was not responsible for Singletary's death as she was shot and killed by her boyfriend, who later committed suicide with the same weapon in a hotel. The alternate juror who replaced Singletary was too frightened to return to her home. On September 20th, 89, Ramirez was convicted of all charges, 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. And like we said before, all of the uh, child kidnapping and molestations, they dropped just to not have to put the kids through. Yeah, so it's not even included in all this. But guilty on all of these. So during the penalty phase on the trial... Uh, of the trial on November 7th, 89, he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. He started, he stated to reporters after the death sentences, big deal. Death was always, death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland. So I did have that quote in there. Yeah, you did. Uh, the trial cost $1.8 million, which is about the same as 3.7, three, three and a quarter million, three and three quarter million in 2020 dollars. And this, uh, Article was written. Uh, at the time, it made it the most expensive uh, trial in the history of California until it was surpassed by the O.J. Simpson murder case in 1984, 1994. I was going to say, up until O.J. got a hold of it. Right. So, uh, about those romantic relationships, like I said, it's called hybr- hybristrophilia. And by the time of the trial, Ramirez had fans who were writing him letters, paying him visits. Beginning in 85, Doreen Loy 
wrote him nearly 75 letters during his incarceration. She was the one who brought him the sunglasses. Did you see how oh. he... he oh, started, yeah. He started wearing sunglasses to his trial because he kept falling asleep. <laughs> so he would wear these sunglasses to hide his eyes so he wouldn't get caught falling asleep during his trial. <laughs> so in night... He, he really just... like, But that just like... Perso- like uh, like increases like star quality yeah. that oh, yeah. uh-huh. showing up in sunglasses uh-huh. and kind of just the long like, hair. You look like a rock star. It like Mick oh, Jagger yeah. with with aviators. Oh, yeah. Um. So yeah, they... in 1988, Ramirez proposed to Loy, and October 3rd, 1996, they were actually married in California's San Quentin State Prison. For many years before Ramirez's death, Loy stated that she would commit suicide when Ramirez was executed, so she could die with him. However, Loy eventually left Ramirez in 2009 after DNA confirmed that he had raped and murdered a nine-year-old, Mei Lung. Uh, by the time of his death in 2013, uh, he was engaged again to Christine Lee, a 23-year-old writer. Yep. So the interesting thing is, is that he didn't get one death sentence. He got nine. Yeah. So, like... They were going to make sure of, he died. And yet none of them were carried out because the, the stupid appeals process takes forever. And I don't know if that existed in California in the it 1980s. It did. Oh. It's mandatory. So that they had the mandatory appeals process yep. then in, in the 80s? No August, wonder why no one's died. August 7th, 2006, Ramirez's first round of state appeals ended unsuccessfully when the California Supreme Court upheld his convictions and death sentence. On September 7th, 2006, the California Supreme Court denied his request for a rehearing. Ramirez had additional appeals pending until the time of his death. Yeah, he ended up dying uh, from complications from B-cell lymphoma. Yep. So, And he died young, too, like 50... He was 53. Yeah, he died young. It was June 7th of 2013. Um, he had lived a life you know, full of chronic substance abuse and chronic hepatitis... C viral infection. He had that that which is a bloodborne pathogen. B cell lymphoma. Um, he'd been on death row for more than twenty three years. By some estimates, he would have been in his early seventies before his execution was actually carried out. Which to, it probably wouldn't have, because it probably would have gotten just pushed, pushed. And well, pushed. that's what it says. Due to California's lengthy appeals process, it would have taken until he was in his seventies before he actually was in. Yeah. Uh, the nurses and the guards that saw him. Uh, when he died, said his skin and the whites of his eyes had turned highlighter green because of the uh, the liver failure he'd had, and then from all the drugs, and then the the lymphoma. Yep. So, couple of quotes I've got. Um, do you have something else? Do you want to run? Oh, well, while he was in jail. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is good. We like this. <laughs> so while he was in jail, um, the actor Sean Penn ended up getting sentenced for thirty two days at San Quentin. And he was placed in the cell right next to Richard, and so Which, isn't that funny? Because isn't Richard in death row? I don't. I don't know if he was in death row at this time. I don't know what time this was. What time period this was? I don't have dates Maybe on any of this. The county jail or something. Yeah. But at the time, Sean Penn was married to Madonna, <laughs> so Madonna would come and visit Sean, and she would see Richard. And one time, she asked him, "Who's that good-looking guy?" Oh, jeez. And Sean, Sean told her that it was the Night Stalker. And asked if she wanted to meet him. And Madonna replied, he gives me the goosebumps, but yeah, <laughs> I want to meet him. Sean laughed and said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so but while there, um, Richard asked Sean for his autograph. So Sean wrote, dear Richard, it's impossible to be incarcerated and not feel a kinship to your fellow inmates. Well, Richard, I've done the impossible. I feel absolutely no kinship with you, Sean Penn. <laughs> 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 so then Richard wrote back and said, Dear Sean, stay in touch and hit him again. Richard Ramirez, 666. Oh, good oh, Lord. Geez. So uh, two other, uh, so there's there's tons of movies, uh, pop culture stuff uh, about it. Um, so you you said, okay, when we were talking about who would play Richard Ramirez. Yeah. Who'd you say? Uh, it was Josh. Okay, Josh, who'd you say? Lou, Lou Diamond Phillips. Did you know that in 2016, The Night Stalker is a film directed by Meg Griffith, Megan Griffiths and starring Lou Diamond Phillips? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> How funny that's is awesome. that? Nailed it. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, I have a list of all of the different movies. Um, but uh, like I said, recently, um, The Night Stalker on Netflix. I, I'd highly recommend it. Go check it out. Uh, there are a couple of quotes that they had in that that he had said in, in his, own, his own voice. 
He said, Satan is a stabilizing force in my life. It gives me a reason to be. It is a driving force that motivates me into doing things. I dream of about this shit. I, Quote, unquote. I just can't. I just can't understand it. So, and then yeah. he says another one. He goes, I was in an alliance with, with the evil that is inherent in human nature. And that is who I was. Walking death. Now that I believe. Yeah. <laughs> he is just a very sick man. Yeah. Very sick. Very, very sick. And, and I mean, you can see like throughout his childhood and all of the, all of the circumstances that led up to him becoming who he was and, and, yeah. leading to him doing what he was going to do yeah you know it's just it's absolutely crazy and in, in that crazy. avenue it's depressing it's sick it's uh, like i said in doing the research for this it was pretty disturbing a lot of it was just very it's hard draw jo- jo- i keep saying draw jopping jaw it was draw jopping yes, yes it was jaw dropping it, it really stunned me and and yeah and I've I've done some pretty I've seen some pretty gross things, um, even professionally over the years I've seen some pretty gross things. But uh, this really just kind of yeah, yeah, it's a lot. What a horrible person! It's it's a lot. Um, speaking of a lot, we've been going for a long time, so I appreciate <laughs> yeah. you hanging into the end of the episode. Absolutely, thank you all for uh, walking down this uh, this dark dark sided journey with us. Um, I would love to say that our our next episode is going to be. Uh, you know, More unicorns positive. and rainbows, but uh, now there's a link of this story there, in our next story. Yeah, absolutely. So come back. So come back and uh, hear about uh, one of the places that Ramirez stayed at uh, on Skid Row, which would be the uh, Cecil or Cecil, I guess, depending how you say it, hotel. I think it's the Kekel. Kekel. We'll <laughs> say it however we want. I can make up what I want. Um, if you like the show, tell your friends, tell your, your family. Uh, we, we appreciate your feedback. If you like the paranormal stuff more, tell us. If you like the the true crime stuff, like the serial killer stuff, you know, we want to please you. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. Doesn't mean we will, but we are curious. We'd love to hear feedback Absolutely. from our listeners. Uh, you can give us feedback on our Facebook page. You can go to uh, Paranormal Peeps Podcast on Facebook. Uh, we also have Cold Spot Paranormal Research on Facebook as well. Absolutely. And you'll find a, a podcast on both of those places. Yep. Um, if you are having uh, things go on your house, on in, in your house that you would like us to come out and investigate uh, and figure out what's going on, um, unless it's like people running around, um, we're talking about ghosty type of, of things. If you have unexplained uh, happenings, uh, come check us out at paranormalhope.com and uh, fill out the questionnaire and we'll be in contact. And we don't charge to come out to your homes. We figure with our experience, we can shed some light on things. And and it's not right that somebody should live in fear in their own home. So we, we just do that as a service just to we want you to be comfortable where you live. And if we can help with that, then that's what it's about. Uh, we do also have a an Instagram page. Yeah, come well. like and follow us on Instagram. We're at cold spot underscore paranormal underscore research. Um, you can come and comment there, leave us messages, get to know us a little bit. With that, stay ghosty, my peeps. See you in two weeks. Thank you for listening to the Paranormal Peeps Podcast. You can find us on social media at Twitter at CPR Paranormal, on Facebook at Paranormal Peeps Podcast, and Cold Spot Paranormal Research. And you can find us on Instagram at Cold Spot underscore Paranormal underscore Research.